Hello, everyone. Hi. Uh, my name is Hyo Guan, and I wanted to just uh, briefly introduce the symposium and explain a little bit about why we organized it. But before we begin, I just wanted to say, on behalf of the, everyone in the symposium, I wanted to express the huge gratitude and admiration for the powerhouse that has been built here. Uh, and thanks to the organizers for trying to keep it alive and going strong despite the difficulties. Um, we, our symposium is titled Towards a More Diverse the Science of Theory of Mind. What do, what, do we, what do we mean by this? We're humans, and we're fascinated by contents of others' minds, and we're curious about it. We really want to know. And we're at a conference. It's the kind of context that really brings it out. Many of you, probably all of you, must have thought at least a few times, what is this person thinking? What's inside that person's mind? How is my talk? And so on and so forth. And in a way, as scientists, we call it an ability or a capacity. It's something that we can do, and perhaps better than other non-human animals. Uh, but in a way, from a more lay perspective, uh, it's something that, that we cannot but do. It, sometimes we can't help it. Uh, we're driven. It's almost like an urge to think about other people's minds. So uh, Hannes' talk yesterday set up the stage really well. Uh, he talked about the uh, different me ways of measuring explicit measures and implicit measures. And he also talked about the, old, uh, the traditional literature and the newer findings. And I think uh, for the past decade and a half, we really found out a lot about the nature of the beliefs, the contents of the re uh, representations, and the processes by which we attribute these mental states. But at the same time, because we've been so focused on can infants do, do this, or at what age? Uh, so perhaps in a way it has constrained the types of tasks we use and how we design it and how we interpret the findings. And, uh, and maybe somehow it, uh, it's worth it to take a step back and think about what is theory of mind? Why do we have it? What is it for? What are the kinds of contents that goes into these mental representations? So that's why we organized the symposium. And I think each one of the three talks by Hannes uh, and Ilde Kokirali and Mika Saba represents uh, some different aspects of looking at this problem and asking these questions. So I invite all of you to think about this a little bit. Uh, but at the same time, even though we organize this to take a step back and diversify, I think the findings here uh, actually will give us more deeper insights into what are these representations and what are the processes and what, is it, what does it mean for us to attribute these mental states. So without further ado, I will turn the mic over. Uh, and uh, after the, these talks, uh, Mike Tomasello will be our discussant to, to integrate the findings and synthesize uh, ideas here and bring his own perspectives and insights. Uh, so uh, thank you for being here. And without further ado, I'll turn the mic over to Hannah. Thanks. I guess I'm, I'm, I pay to everyone. Thank you. Uh, thanks so much to here for organizing this symposium, and thanks once again to the organizers of this wonderful conference. Um, what I'll be concerned with in my talk is um, uh, um, a phenomenon that we stumbled across that concerns the more protracted development of theory of mind and its relation to pragmatics way beyond the preschool years in which it is usually studied. So it's going to be very phenomenon oriented and very exploratory what I'm, uh, I'm going to do in this talk. Um, so obviously theory of mind and pragmatics, roughly the, the interpretation of speaker's utterance meanings are intimately connected and how intimately of course depends on your theory of pragmatics uh, and how relatively they assign weights to convention versus intention in pragmatics. The more role is put on intention in relative to convention, of course, the more pragmatics reduces, in fact, to theory of mind. Now, they're intimately related in theory of mind and other uh, research areas uh, in a number of ways. So, in, uh, in the study of early theory of mind in classical explicit force belief tasks, pragmatics has played a role as an important uh, performance factor. So a number of authors have argued this is what you actually see in terms of performance in such standard tasks, but what that masks is the actual underlying competence that is present much earlier uh, and that is masked in fact by pragmatic performance factors of these tasks. So one of the first suggestions along those lines came by Michael Siegel and colleagues arguing that if you ask children the test question where will uh, Maxi look first for his chocolate in false belief task, that uh, actually reduces the pragmatic uh, confusing performance factors because it reduces the reading of where will he look in terms of normative 
rather than descriptive expectations. Where should he look? So this is one way. Another way is um, uh, studying protracted development in theory of mind and its relation to more complex pragmatic phenomena, in particular the interpretation of indirect speech acts, speech acts where speakers utterance meaning and sentence meaning diverge, for example, in uh, metaphor and irony. And sometimes the, the, uh, the developmental causes of these different forms of understanding indirect speech acts have been plotted against each other in order to test theoretical predictions, for example, of relevance theory, which pr predict exactly such a relative pattern of metaphor understanding preceding irony understanding. Depending how you plot the y-axis, you also get things like decreasing competence uh, over time uh, over developmental, sorry, the animation, oh, sorry, the animation uh, got lost here. What you should see is a, uh, is a reverse curve such that over time you see a decrease in capacity with age and with growing theory of mind performance. If, for example, you plot logical reading of, say, quantifier use. So that refers to phenomena like scalar implicatus. Implicatus such that if I say um, I ate some of the cookies, this logically is compatible with my eating all of the cookies, but pragmatically, usually if I say I ate some of the cookies, I implicate that I didn't eat all of the cookies. Now, younger kids are more logical here than older kids in the sense that they don't find it funny if I say I ate some of the co cookies when in fact I ate all of them. Uh, and this purely logical reading of quantifiers decreases with age when kin kids become more sensitive to such pragmatic um, instances like scalar implicatures. What I want to talk about today is, uh, is another kind of curve, a weird thing we stumbled across recently, a kind of U-shaped curve in the protracted development uh, of pragmatics and theory of mind. And my apologies to those of you who were here yesterday during the pre-conference. There'll be some overlap and redundancy with some of the things I talked about yesterday, but I'll go into uh, more detail today and uh, stress some other aspects. So what is this strange phenomenon that we stumbled across? Um, it's a phenomenon that children in very trivial uh, tasks that were devised as control tasks for theory of mind tasks show such a U-shaped uh, curve. And what I represent in the following is the work from the dissertation by uh, Nisha Oktaigur, who did a, uh, a series of studies to uh, uncover and explain this phenomenon. So, uh, actually, there are a couple of accounts that predict, would predict such uh, U-shaped curve patterns in such true belief tasks uh, on theoretical grounds. Two main uh, types of theories. One, a, um, um, a perceptual axis reasoning account by Bill Fabrizius and others that posits a number of uh, uh, stages in which children operate with uh, simple heuristics that makes them pass false belief tasks, but not because they operate with full-fledged theory of mind, but because they operate with simple heuristics that would lead to these strange patterns in the true belief tasks. So what they posit is three stages. Before four years of age, children reason simply about reality. So when they are asked what someone will do or will believe, they just revert to reality. And that means they will pass, false belie uh, they will pass true belief tests and false, uh, fail false belief tests. From four to six, um, they acquire another heuristic they're called the perceptual axis reasoning heuristic that says roughly, if an agent has had full perceptual axis, she will act successfully, otherwise she will act unsuccessfully. And this actually predicts the reverse pattern, the paradoxical pattern such that children pass false belief tasks but fail true belief control tasks. And only from much later on will children then revert to real belief reasoning that allows them to pass those kinds of tasks. So this account actually predicts this U-shaped curve for these trivial control true belief tasks for a specific kind of uh, them in which the agent lacks perceptual access of some sort, so misses some part of the scene that's completely irrelevant, however, for the true belief she forms. A second kind of account uh, is an account by Joseph Perrin and colleagues that posits a similar um, U-shaped curve for another class of specific tasks, those tasks that have to do with an aspectual, an aspectual re representation of the target object, where the target object has two identities, and the question is how the agent would represent the given object. Um, so um, here, is, uh, here is a paper from that tradition that actually predicts and then finds exactly that pattern for these kinds of tasks. 
growing performance such that children first fail and then pass false belief tasks, which show the reverse pattern uh, in, the, uh, in the true belief control tasks. We were wondering um, about an alternative in terms of pragmatics, uh, th such that these U-shaped curves may reflect not competence limitations, but pragmatic performance limitations. Now, what may these be? What may be so pragmatically um, limiting about these cases? Well, the starting intuition is uh, these are really, really strange tasks. They're totally trivial. Uh, there is an agent who witnesses everything, and then you ask them, uh, what would the agent believe? What will the agent turn out to be? Uh, and this, the, uh, the intuition is, is a, a, very, uh, a very clear way of irritating people uh, pragmatically. So this is, a, this is a, a from a pre-Monty Python program by John Cleese and, uh, and others, Michael Palin, before they formed Monty Python, that was called How to Irritate People. And they've got a number of great um, instances of that show. And I just want to give you an example uh, of those uh, ways of irritating people. So here is an interview, uh, a job interview, uh, in which someone is irritated. Ah, come in, sit down. Thank you. Thank you. Would you mind just standing up for a moment? Yeah. Thank you. Take a seat. What? Take a seat. Ah. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> Tommy, uh, why did you say good morning when you know perfectly well that it's afternoon? Well, you said good morning. <laughs> <laughs> good afternoon. Good afternoon. Oh, oh dear. dear. <laughs> Good evening. Goodbye. <laughs> why do you think I rang that? Uh, aren't you going to ask me why I rang that bell? No. Possibly. <laughs> why did you ring that bell? Why do you think I rang that bell? <laughs> Five, four, three, two, one. <laughs> too late, too late. Okay, it goes on like this very painfully. Just an illustration um, how we can irritate people by asking strange questions. And that's the underlying intuition here. Perhaps uh, this is a way of irritating children. Um, so why am I that may this be so irritating? Um, it, the intuition here is it's a, it's a combination of factors. Um, it's a very, very trivial question. Uh, it's an academic test question. It's posed not because you want to know something, but because you want to test the kid, just like in this interview. And it's about a rational agent's perspective. Well, we usually ask questions regarding their perspectives and actions uh, in case where there's at least a possibility of misrepresentation uh, or something like that. So this Alternative account in terms of pragmatic performance factors predicts then a U-shaped curve uh, for all kinds of true belief tasks, and it predicts second that this uh, that this pattern will disappear once you modify the pragmatic task factors uh, in the form of these three uh, three types. Okay, so regarding the first prediction, what we did is we tested children in all different types of true belief tasks. Um, are spectral false belief tasks and standard false belief tasks, and those are the two classes for which the two competence limitations account predict. The one predicts the U-shaped curve here, the other predicts it there. The performance account would predict it everywhere. Um, and the difference between true and false belief conditions is in whether the agent sees the relevant fact in the second step. Here is the finding, uh, first from standard task, and then, thank you, from the uh, from the uh, spectral task, so from the standard task, we see, sorry, let's go back to this, the three-year-olds perform as they should in true belief task, pass the true belief, uh, but fail false belief, adults pass both, and in between we see the standard curve for false belief, C performance is competent from around four years of age, and a U-shaped curve for the true belief, and much the same pattern for aspectuality, and we see strong negative relations between the tasks. 
Um, so that bears out the first prediction. What about the second one? Uh, uh, you can make the effect go away once you modify the pragmatic task factors. So what we did is we tried to, uh, to modify the, sev uh, the different factors I've listed here. So first we asked, would the same uh, effect appear once you remove um, the fact that the question is about a rational agent's perspective? And what we did to test that is we pitted uh, false and true belief tests against false and true photo tests as um, developed by Deborah Satchik a couple of years ago. So here is the logic. You see, uh, you see there's a, an object put into box one and then transferred to box two. Uh, and here you see the standard, uh, standard um, procedure for the false and true belief tasks. For the true and false photo task, you take a Polaroid camera uh, and in the so-called false photo ta task, you make a Polaroid photo at this point, and then while it develops, uh, the object is transferred. Whereas in the true photo task, you make the photo at this stage, and then while it develops, the object stays where it is. So in this photo, the object will be, will be in box one, and in this photo, it will be in box two. Um, so you could say everything is, is constant. It's equally trivial. It's equally a test question. Uh, but this is not about a rational agent's perspective. It's about uh, the representations, if you will, of a camera. And here are, in fact, the findings. We see the same asymmetry, and these are three to five-year-olds, the same pattern uh, in the belief task. Children pass the false but um, uh, fail the true belief task, but no difference in the false photo task. So that reinforces the impression it has something to do with asking about a rational agent's perspective. What about the other factors if you remove the triviality uh, and the academic test question? Um, so first of all, we removed uh, questions altogether and we used a non-verbal false and true belief task based on the CHIMP task by Josep Cole and Mike Tomasello. Um, so it goes roughly like this. Um, so you've got two boxes and an object and the uh, object is hidden in one of them. You don't know which one. Then you see the boxes, they look identical, they're swapped. Uh, and then an agent who has been present uh, during the previous indicates it's here. Uh, the agent has either in the true belief condition, condition witnessed everything, thus knows where the, uh, the object is, or she hasn't witnessed in the false belief condition the crucial swap. So you don't know where it is, but you know that she has a false belief. So in the false belief condition, when she indicates it's here, you can infer it must be here, whereas in the true belief condition, you know she knows, so if she indicates it's here, you can infer it is here. And here's what we see in four to seven-year-old kids. This is a relatively difficult task. That's why um, uh, performance in the false belief task is lower than in standard tasks, but we see the usual pattern of growing competence in false belief tasks, but a relatively constant uh, above chance performance between four and seven and true belief tasks. So if, re if you remove the question altogether, there is no such paradoxical true belief uh, pattern. So since I'm running out of time, I'll jump to the end and um, ask um, um, open questions. So this is, as I said, relatively phenomenon oriented and exploratory in the first step. The two crucial questions are, of course, what exactly happens here when children start to master false and fail true belief tasks? What is pragmatically going on that leads them astray? How are they irritated and confused? And then secondly, what happens here? This doesn't remain, uh, they don't remain irritated forever. Adults, of course, can figure out all kinds of ways why people ma may ask irritating questions. Um, so what is exactly going on here? So here's a, uh, here's a, here's a lay analogy, uh, and it's really lay, it may be completely wrong, but, but my impression uh, as a lay football player, if you, if you play against defenders, is um, beginning defenders uh, are sometimes more difficult to play against than intermediate defenders. Beginning defenders are very uh, ball focus. So you can't trick them in any ways because they look at the ball and they will follow where the ball is going. But then once you become a more sophisticated defender, it's more difficult uh, to play against them because they operate now with simple mind reading and they try to do what you, uh, uh, sorry, it's, it, it, in, in a sense it gets easier. They engage in simple mind reading. They try to anticipate what you do and that makes them susceptible to trick moves. You can trick them by simple moves in certain directions. Then once they get more advanced, 
they do advanced mind reading uh, that is potentially recursively open-ended, so you can anticipate your tricks and you're trying to trick them and so on and so forth, so that they can anticipate and neutralize your trick modes. That's, as I said, is a, is a naive lay theory, maybe completely wrong, uh, but that doesn't matter whether it's wrong or not. It's just an analogy here. Um, that would correspond to the literal listener, the three roads. They would just go for uh, sentence meaning when they hear these trivial task questions. Then they become simple pragmatists, and that leads them astray. That gets them irritated. And at some point, they get sophisticated pragmatists, uh, and that can make sense of weird questions, that can make sense of John Cleese uh, and developmental psychologists. So what exactly would that mean, this advanced mind reading? And that's one of the open questions for future research. Where does this advancement come from? Is it a question of levels of recursion they engage in? This would correspond to the uh, to the research of children's understanding of metaphor and irony, where the idea is irifor, uh, irony uh, is uh, sort of one complexity level up from metaphor. Is it a question of reaching a certain threshold level of recursive flexibility? Once you've reached that, you can make sense of everything because you can always go up one step. Or is it generally uh, growing flexibility of abductive inferences? So these inferences we are engaging in here are terrible because they are formally not really um, uh, modelable. You can't model them because they are abductive in the sense that everything can play into them. Everything is a potential premise in these inferences. And perhaps what grows around this age is flexibility of abductive inferences. So um, many open questions and many thanks, especially again to Nisha, whose work this has been, and to all the other colleagues, and thanks for your attention. Should we take, yeah, should we, uh, we can take one question while we uh, switch computers. Um, yes? start to show um, in, in, some kind of inflection of improvement with false belief and when they start to show the downward trend in the U-shaped curve with true belief. And if, that, if there is a unified account, that might make sense of, of that. Yes, we did look at that. Um, so, uh, uh, so there are massive negative correlations. Uh, so, so it is the same kids that start to fail the true beliefs, fail, start to pass the false and then fail the true belief part. Yeah. And, and what's the theory for that? What's the well, the theory broadly, the, the uh, if I, I wouldn't call it a theory, but the intuition is, um, as I said, is you, you so the passing the false belief part signals advancement in mind reading, which makes you susceptible to the pr pragmatics, uh, which makes you wonder why is she asking me that? So the, oh sorry. So the literal, the literal three-year-old listener um, sticks more to, to sentence meaning, um, whereas the four-year-old or the five-year-old, the simple pragmatist, starts to get uh, worried about pragmatic questions. Why is she doing that? Um, and then you uh, you get led astray by trying to make sense of that. Why you answer wrongly in a what? In a true belief? Uh, why you answer what? It's Sorry. Well, if you're a, if you're a, well, you have to be a literal listener at three and incapable of meta representation. That would be the account. So you your so once you apply meta representation, you get pragmatically sensitive, which makes you pragmatically irritable, so to speak. Uh, and then once you grow some more pragmatic sophistication, you can overcome the irritation. That's the idea. So, thank you very much for the invitation and uh, good to see that many. So, thank you for Hannes and if you would like to applaud now. <laughs> And now I can store, start my presentation. So today I would like to introduce you a set of studies that uh, would like to grasp some basic retrospective, 
retrospective attribution processes. But the main question will be whether do young children, 18 months old, revise their attributive beliefs or not? And the main question will focus related to the overall question to when is actually beliefs are attributed in a standard false belief scenario. Aggie uh, gave you a similar task yesterday and I would like to ask you to recall your responses to the task. And uh, if you just check this scenario, you can see that uh, there are at least one option. Uh, however, re with respect to your previous answers, dependent on the three uh, different uh, frames uh, plotted on that picture, you could imply and imagine different cognitive capacities that actually require different processes to be able to succeed in the task. The first option uh, is, in a sense, a prospective uh, process in which you uh, attribute a belief already when Maxi hides the chocolate into the container. And in that case, you only maintain that representation for later uh, scenarios, like here, the search in the situation, and you are able to predict the behavior of Moxie just having a true belief maintained without changing the status of it into false belief. And uh, uh, I would like to say that we call this prospective belief attribution because at the time point of attribution, there is no extra benefit of the attribution process itself, however, it is, used, it is maintained for later use. And uh, uh, in uh, addition, there is no need to change the kind of nature of this belief into false. If you have the true belief that's maintained, you can use that for predictive uh, purposes. Note, however, while this seems to be a simple process, this attribution method requires an efficient selection criteria, selection method, uh, as to judge what true beliefs, which true beliefs uh, are to be attributed and tracked. Uh, otherwise, the prospective memory could be overloaded. The second option is quite different. If you voted for the time point somewhere around uh, where Moxie is there to search for the chocolate, uh, you voted for uh, computation in which case Moxie's behavior can only be predicted with the help of recollection of previous events in the situation. So you are in search of events that help you to understand the connection between Moxie and the chocolate, and you rely on uh, memory processes in that scenario. Indeed, the, in that case, what you attribute by definition is a false belief in the situation, and you recruit episodic memory competencies to solve a task. However, there is also a third option, a third potential option here, namely that you attribute a belief when you realize that there is a change of state in the situation. So actually, when you yourself detect that your own belief is updated, and that update in your own belief uh, triggers an investigation that there could be someone, there might be someone who has a belief with respect to the state of affairs, and relatedly, you need to update the belief of that person. Uh, in this situation, the belief is false, by definition again. However, it, this process may or ma may not require episodic memory. We can check it later. Crucially, all st existing studies that are there in the literature cannot disentangle these three options that I listed with respect to the standard force belief task. So the main purpose of ours was to create a task that cannot be solved without recalling the details of a past event that epistemically connect the agent to the relevant factors. And in this uh, project, we closely built uh, on the study of Southgate, Chevalier, and Chibra, and actually the true belief version of, of the study. In this study, the main uh, uh, manipulation is that the, the experiment, experimenter one hides two novel objects into two locations. So both locations will contain an object that was unknown, that are unknown and non-labeled for the kid 
who is present. Uh, in the true belief version and in our version as well, the protagonist, the experimenter remains there while the other experimenter changes the location of uh, the object. And after that, uh, I will introduce the modifications here, but in the original task, the ex experimenter one who first initially hid the uh, object points to one of the location names the object for the, same, for the first time in the scenario. I put a Cepho here, there are a couple of versions. Remember, I put a Cepho here, a Cepho is here. And then request for the Cepho as they are going to pay together with that uh, object. In that scenario, the target vari variable is that the kid will give the requested object to the uh, uh, model. And in the case when she actually attributes the, uh, the, 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 her response, the kid's response, should be driven by the belief content of the experimenter. If she has a true belief, the object she wants is, the, is in the referred box, the appointed ad box. In the other situation, as she was not there for the uh, location change, the referred object should be in the non-referred container. Therefore, the uh, kid should give from the other container. The modification we introduced was a very simple fact, that we requested the model being there to wear a pair of sunglasses. And we introduced a kind of intermediate step there, you see up there, that after the uh, location change of the object, the kid could herself explore the uh, pair of sunglasses. And in one condition, those pairs of sunglasses were transparent, as you could have uh, guessed before. But in the critical experimental condition, those pair of sunglasses were opaque. And that's what we call the revision induction phase. If children have access to any retrospective attribution, they might detect that this fact is relevant with respect to the belief content of the, the uh, experimenter, and therefore they need to revise what they have uh, attributed before. So in the case of the opaque uh, sunglasses, the inference is that actually those uh, sunglasses would not allow the otherwise present experimenter to follow what's going on, and she there should have a false belief. Let me show you some examples here. First, uh, how a three-year-old kid. We tested three-year-olds at 18 months old in the initial study. Okay, so. Just uh, briefly, you see that in this modified version, what we did, we did not keep the pointing there, rather we implemented in a pragmatic version and invited the kid to remember the pointing event but focus on the content of the, the partner. And let me show you an example with an... Vedd ki nekem a szefót! Kérem a szefót! Oh, pont a szefó! Na no, hát, és a másik játék is átvett oda! No, hát. Let me show you then what we have for this version of the study. In the uh, true belief condition, clearly the kids gave from the pointed at uh, container. However, three-year-olds were able to update their belief and gave from the other box. In contrast, 18 months old did give from the reformed containers all the time. We ad additionally tested whether they can use the information that the, actually the opacity of the sunglasses for later belief revision in a version where they were able to explore the sunglasses before the uh, hiding event, and in that case, we could replicate conceptually the previous findings that in a prospective manner, they can 
use information for false belief. However, the contrast you see there, that while older children were able to retrospectively attribute false beliefs in the task, uh, younger ones were not able to do that. And we postulated that uh, the, there is a potential that either they revised the older ones and already attributed to belief, or they were able to compute a new belief when it became necessary. So, the question is whether they are able to revise beliefs retrospectively. In this case, we changed the direction of the attribution process because we thought that uh, it's the problem for the younger ones could have been that they could not revise an already attributed true belief, but the question remained open whether they can uh, attribute a pro a new false belief retrospectively, or it's probable that the revision processes can be easier. So, in this version, we turn to the false belief version of the Southgate uh, Chevalier and Chibra study with a one way mirror task. And we introduce three conditions an exact replication of the original false belief version of the study. The protagonist left the uh, scenario and uh, came back. And in the other two versions, in, in both cases, the child was requested to call the experimenter back, and in one version she found the uh, experimenter there reading a book. However, in the other condition, she could saw that the model is speaking uh, through a one-way mirror. So, uh, in that case, we suggested that if true beliefs are computed already, this is a uh, recomputation, that a true belief need to be revised based on the episodic recall and turned into a false belief. However, it's just a revision. They know that they can get rid of uh, an already computed false belief, then it seems to be an easier process. Let me show the data. We did replicate our previous finding with three-year-olds with, with a different uh, uh, retrospective re evaluation task. But let me focus on the data with the 18 months old. Actually, we could show with this uh, implementation method uh, uh, high fidelity replication of the original false belief version of uh, Wiki. And the version in which the model was just reading there, the pattern of data mirrors the original study. However, in the scenario when they could have detected that the experimenter was able to get access to the scenario through a one-way mirror, they actually chose the pointed at box and the different pattern of data was shown. What we need to say here that in this case, the pattern uh, for the younger ones is not different from the older ones. Briefly, I would like to conclude that we replicated our previous study, as I mentioned, also uh, the false belief version of Southgate et al. Th but the main message here, that if young ones only need to revise an already attributed false belief, they are able to do that. So the failure of them in study one could have been you probably not attributing true beliefs at all, and at the same time, retrospective attribution could be more demanding than retrospective revision. And as a final note, I would li like to add that this version of the study promotes the third option of the routes children can uh, recruit for themselves in these situations, as in this uh, sense, the memory com uh, uh, contribution here is only that one need to encode the epistemic source of information together with the belief content. That's enough to disregard an already computed false belief, which could be easier than the previous task. And thank you for your attention. Questions, please, if you have a moment while.
these. In this last statement about um, binding epistemic uh, uh, state or, or commitment to the prior um, assertion in your mind that you know it is here, um, this ties into uh, an earlier conversation of, you know many of us were having about representing possibilities. So when you represent um, with, with certain commitment X, I believe that the thing is hiding here. Does that, in your mind, naturally suggest that an 18-month-old is also representing, and with one minus x, I believe, or something, you know, some other calculation? I I believe that it's not there. So that's the tricky issue. So. Somehow, an, or anyhow, if you track a belief, you need to be able to individuate that belief and understand when that is the belief I in relation which any state of effect can be uh, relevant or can be related. And that, in a minimal sense, would allow me to say yes to your question. So that requires the understanding of what kind of possible alternative beliefs can be there in contrast to that belief shortly. Hi everyone. Um, can everyone hear me in the back? Awesome, okay. My name is Mika, I'm a fourth year student working with Hyo Guan. So today I'd like to start out with this question. Can I just get a quick show of hands if a child has ever told you that they want to show you something really cool? Okay, awesome, thank you. This is a super common experience for a lot of us. Now let's think about the kinds of things that kids actually tell us. So you can imagine that you're excited, you wanna see something really cool, but then they just start flipping on all the light switches in the house or they start counting anything around them. Maybe they just start tying their shoes and explaining how to tie your shoes. So the question that we're after today is why? Why are they doing this and what is driving this kind of communication? Do they really think that we don't know how to tie our shoes? Probably not, well hopefully not, but we know from a lot of prior work that young children seem to be really attuned to what others know or don't know. So rather than trying to convey something about shoes and the causal structure of tying one's shoes, perhaps in these instances, children are trying to convey something about the self. And they might be considering others' beliefs about their abilities to tie their shoes or others' beliefs about their knowledge of light switches. Now, when we study theory of mind, we typically study children's abilities to represent beliefs about physical states of the world, like where an object is or what an object is. But as adults, it's clear that we can also represent what others think of us, the self, who we are, what we're like, what we're good at, what can be improved. And it's clear that this is a suite of beliefs that we care a lot about and one that we're really highly motivated to think about. So we wanna make a good first impression on others. We wanna know whether our in-laws like us or not. We wanna build relationships or at least maintain them in academic settings. Now all this to say that our curiosity about what others think about us is undeniable. Now it's the case that we not only care about these beliefs, but they're also deeply and powerfully consequential on our behaviors and choices, our social interactions and communications with others, and even how we conceive and understand who we are. And our work aims to investigate the early emerging cognitive capacities that might be underlying these really rich behaviors and phenomena. So today what I'm going to try to argue is that even young children have the capacity to rationally infer others' beliefs about the self, and that this supports how they then subsequently interact and communicate with others. So the situations that I'm going to set up today are ones when children think that they can do something, 
but others think that they cannot. And then we're going to see how children subsequently communicate given this discrepancy in beliefs about what they can or cannot do. So in this first study, we recruited three, four, and five-year-old children, and we showed them these two toys. So there's a green toy here that lights up when you pull some levers, and a red toy that makes music when you push some buttons. So in this task, I first just show kids the toys that they're going to play with, and then they meet a naive observer, Anne, who tells them that she's never seen these toys before, and she doesn't know anything about them. So first, I will walk you through the absent condition. And children play with what we call the observed toy first, because Anne, the observer, is in the room watching them. So in this video that I'm about to play, Anne is already in the room, and she's sitting right next to me. See what this toy can do? Yes. OK, ready? One, two, three, go. Okay, so first I succeed. Okay, now you can try. Ready, go. Hmm. Okay, then the child okay. fails. All right, let me try it again. Okay, one, two, three, go. And then this is repeated once more. Wow, that's really cool. Okay, now you can try. Ready? <laughs> Three, go. Hmm. Okay, so you know what? You have to push this button. So then I teach how the toy works. At the exact same time. Okay. Okay. Cool. Well, I have to go. See you later. Bye. And then Anne, our observer, leaves the room. Okay, Malachi, do you want to try again? Yes. Okay. One, two, three, go. <laughs> okay, great. Kind of an underwhelming response, but the point here is that children fail twice on this toy and eventually succeed, but critically Anne leaves before the child has actually succeeded on the toy. So then children play with what we call the unobserved toy because Anne is out of the room the entire time. And again, children fail twice and succeed once on this toy, so their experience on the two toys is matched. So in this condition, Anne the observer sees the toy, she learns what it can do, but critically she only sees the child fail on the toy. And so here, Anne leaves understanding how the toy works. She saw my instruction, but she thinks that the child cannot make it go. So this condition was contrasted with the present condition that was almost identical, except that Anne does see the child's success, and then she leaves the room. So here, again, Anne knows how the toy works, but she thinks that the child actually can make it work. So in both conditions, for the unobserved toy, the confederate is ignorant about the toy and how it works, and ignorant to the child's successes on the toy. So really the only difference between these two conditions is whether or not the observer saw the child's success on that first toy. So then at the end of the task, we ask children which toy they want to show Anne. So what should children do here? Well, in both conditions, children have strong reasons to show Anne the unobserved toy. She's never seen it before, she doesn't know how it works, she's never seen the child succeed on it. And indeed, what we see in the present condition is that children are selectively choosing the unobserved toy to show to Anne, suggesting that they may want to provide her with some novel information. But our main prediction for this experiment was that across conditions, children would be more likely to choose the observed toy in the absent condition than in the present condition to the extent that they can infer Anne's beliefs about what they can do on that toy and that they are motivated to actually show off to her that in fact they can make it work. And indeed, that's what we're seeing. So here in the absent condition, we see that children are more likely to choose that observed toy than in the present condition. So then we ran a replication with just three and four-year-old participants, and we see the exact same pattern as before. Again, suggesting that children are motivated to communicate about their competence on that toy. And so you might be wondering why children are at chance in the absent condition. 
And one possibility that we were thinking about is that perhaps children are torn between teaching something new on the unobserved toy and showing off their competence on the observed toy. So to test this possibility, in our third and final experiment here, we removed the pull to show Anne a new toy by making her fully knowledgeable about both toys from the very beginning. And then we ran the same absent condition as before, so Anne only observes the child's failures on that first toy, she does not see the success. And, and what we see is that children are now selectively choosing that observed toy to show to Anne, suggesting that they indeed want to demonstrate their competence to her and on that specific toy. So let's take a second to think about the nature of children's representations here. So after the observer saw the child's failures on the observed toy, what are children thinking? So if children are only representing the observer having a globally negative impression of them, then they could improve that by choosing either toy, and they should still be at chance in this condition. If they were only representing Anne's ignorance, that she doesn't know that in fact they can succeed on each toy, then again, children should still be at chance here. So their preference in this experiment for choosing the observed toy suggests that they may be representing a contentful belief about their performance on that specific toy and that they're motivated to, to revise this specific belief. So collectively, what these results suggest to us is that children are using Anne's observations of their failures and successes to infer her beliefs about what they can or cannot do. And they seem to be able to use these inferences to then guide their communicative decisions about the self. So in another set of experiments, we ran a conceptual replication of the same present and absent conditions, except that we've swapped out the human observer for a hand puppet. And again, what we saw is that children were more likely to show the observed toy when the puppet had only seen their failures on that toy suggesting that young children actually seem motivated to demonstrate their competence to a puppet. However, it seems that children only do this when we depict the puppet as an agent capable of holding mental states. So when we remove all cues to agency, we also remove the effect. So these results have implications for our methods as developmental psychologists, um, as our methods often rely on the use of hand puppets or cartoon characters or stuffed animals. And I hope it's helpful to know that children seem to be motivated to show off to these non-human entities to the extent that we're treating them and depicting them as agents, which they usually are in our experiments. And this finding also has implications for children's interactions with robots. So given that young children seem to be increasingly interacting with smart technologies and robot tutors, it will be really important for us to know whether they are actually concerned about messing up or failing in front of them. So finally, I just have one more study. So in theory of mind, we typically study true or false beliefs. But the thing that's so interesting about beliefs about the self is that they can not only be evaluated with respect to their accuracy, but also their desirability, whether the belief is positive or not. And so in this final study, what we've done is we've asked whether children might be willing to maintain others' inflated beliefs about the self. So beliefs that are inaccurate, but desirable. And so in this task, we recruited four-year-old children, and first, children make a drawing of a tree. Then an observer, our friend Anne, comes in, and she looks at what she thinks is the child's drawing. Then later, the, the child finds out what the observer was actually looking at, which for this girl was a really good drawing of a tree, a tree much better than her own. And for a separate group of kids, they find out that the observer was actually looking at a really bad drawing of a tree, a tree much worse than their own. So then later, children have a choice of what to do with this observer. And the question is whether they choose to do more drawing or whether they choose to play with blocks instead. And so critically here, and, um, across these two conditions, the confederate has an inaccurate belief about what the child drew, but it's either a desirable belief or an undesirable belief. 
And so the idea is that if children are motivated to maintain others' inflated beliefs about what they can do, then they should be more likely to avoid drawing and choose blocks in the better condition than in the worse condition. And that's exactly what we found in this experiment. So this is, suggests to us that at least in some contexts, children seem willing to preserve these false but inflated beliefs about their abilities. And I hope that in our future work, we can think more about the contextual factors or motivations or representations that might be contributing to how children are weighing accuracy and desirability in their decisions about what to communicate about the self. Okay, so let's just go back to our initial proposal here and think about what kids are actually doing in these studies. So first, they seemed able to use Anne's observations of them, their failures and successes on the toy or the quality of their drawings to infer her beliefs about their competence. Second, in the absence of Anne, children could maintain this representation even when her belief was rendered outdated when they did eventually succeed on that toy. And finally, children understood what information might change or maintain Anne's beliefs about them, and they provided that information accordingly. So if you look at this, these are the exact same inferential and communicative processes at play in classic theory of mind tasks. tasks. And I think our findings can offer a few additional points about theory of mind. The first is that theory of mind can operate flexibly across domains, it seems to be able to support not only belief representations of physical objects and physical states, but also representations of self or agents more broadly. These belief representations are multidimensional, and children seem to be able to evaluate them with respect to their accuracy or consistency, but also their desirability. And finally, I think it's interesting to think about theory of mind as a double-edged sword. It can not only support our social interactions with others, but might also contribute to our anxieties or worries or concerns about ourselves. So moving forward in some ongoing work, we're formalizing the trade-off between epistemic and self-presentational goals and asking about the consequences of self-relevant goals on adults and infants, exploration, persistence, and learning behaviors broadly. And so, in closing, I think that this work suggests that children don't just care about what others think about them, though they certainly do, but they can also actively communicate and teach others about the self. And in future work, I think it's exciting to think about how we actually might be learning something about ourselves um, from these rich capacities to represent what other people think about us. Okay, thank you. Great talk, thank you very much. There's one question. So if a child intends uh, to cause uh, Anne to change her mind uh, in thi when she thinks that the child cannot manipulate the, to the toy, this looks like a higher order meta-representational intentions regarding already a representation which the child already meta-represents. Would, mm -hmm. would you agree with that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think children great. need to be... Great. I love it, mm -hmm. thank you. <laughs> okay, great. Uh-huh. You can take one more. Mm -hmm. I was wondering whether you would find the same phenomenon in this study. Thanks. So I was wondering if uh, if you didn't use adults but peers, mm -hmm. uh, would you would you find the same concern or yeah, to I repair your reputation? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. So I think there are to inform them. Mm -hmm. So I think there are potentially different motivations when we're communicating about ourselves with peers. So it's, um, so my hunch is that with these tasks with three and four year olds, we would see the same pattern of results, but you could imagine older children might be more concerned with making their peers feel good about themselves. So if it was the case that their peers couldn't draw themselves or also couldn't make the toy go, then children might want to protect or regulate their peers' emotions and not try to show off as they are doing for adults. So I think there are different motivations and concerns, but I think the same, um, the same underlying capacity would be there 
in a context with their peers. And in terms of the intention to teach them new information. So mm -hmm. you may, may see adults as more likely to know, uh, so you are less motivated to actually teach a new skill than mm. to a peer. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think in the, in the present condition, there are such strong reasons to show the unobserved toy that for their peers, I think they should be just as motivated to teach them there. Yeah. Yeah, thank you for the talk. Um, uh, I was wondering, I saw that these uh, choices were about 50% in most of the studies, so I was wondering if you believe these are individual differences or if this is a developmental stage or developmental difference and uh, whether this is about belief attribution or striving for social acceptance. Mm -hmm. So I think you're right that it's not clear whether these are individual differences or not. It's possible in the absent condition that some children might be more motivated to teach about the unobserved toy than to show off about their abilities on the observed toy. Um, I think it feels intuitive that as adults there are intu that, that there are individual differences in our motivations for genuinely helping someone versus helping someone but also kind of showing off um, versus always just showing off. And so I think it's totally possible that um, preschoolers and elementary school kids also have some um, individual differences that might come out of their personality or the different kinds of contexts that they're in. Um, your second point about whether this is belief attribution or just striving for social acceptance, I think, um, I don't, I don't know that those are mutually exclusive possibilities. I think that this driving for social acceptance is a motivation that might be um, uh, motivating the kinds of communication that we're seeing and that could work hand in hand with our ability to um, represent these beliefs and try to revise them. Um, but I think experiment three in the first set of experiments suggests that, um, that there are some that there has to be some representation there. Um, I was wondering, so um, in, in most of your samples, you had this three to four year old sample. Uh, so that's like spanning the age where usually yeah. the uh, traditional false belief tests are passed. And uh, I was also wondering whether, so I was wondering whether you took them apart and whether there was this typical trend between three and four that we know from the traditional ones and whether you directly compared performance, for example, in the three-year-olds or in the whole sample between the traditional and um, the self-belief uh, related ones, because there could be different predictions, right? Either it could be easier because it's more important and more salient to you, the belief about yourself, or it could be more difficult because it's more complex in some way as being a higher order mm -hmm. belief. Yeah, yeah, so that's actually exactly what we're trying to figure out right now. So we are running um, a replication of that third experiment with a larger sample of three-year-olds and four-year-olds so that we can actually look at just three-year-olds and see how they're doing in that experiment. Um, I think, and we all are also running um, a theory of mind battery that um, has all the, uh, uh, the theory of mind scale um, questions in there. Um, your second point about which one might come earlier or which one might be easier, I think that there are a few different possibilities. So one is that they could just emerge at the same time, um, the uh, children's performance on this task and their performance on traditional tasks. I think it's possible that um, representations of self and others' minds could be easier to represent because you're actually just representing you. And so that content could be easier to hold. It also might be more motivating for you to actually infer and represent these beliefs. On the other hand, the kinds of um, uh, qualities that children are representing in these tasks are abstract and requires them to actually understand something about ability and competence. And so I think like which one comes first might depend on um, what children know about the self and 
what kinds of qualities we're asking them to, um, uh, to represent in these experiments. Hi, I've just got a question. Yeah, can you see? Um, I just wanted to pick up on the individual differences question to ask whether you ha are uh, looking into the impact of parenting and caregiving in daycare styles on these infants' responses, because if they're motivated to want to show them that they can do something well or, or show them the right way of doing that toy in the context of a kind of, say, quite American, kind of cool, uh, you know, everything's great mm -hmm. sort of way in which you were showing in those videos versus a more laid-back British Victorian father way <laughs> where they're not interested in anything, um, right. whether you're kind of building on how likely that child is to try and impress that um, agent mm -hmm. um, and whether that would impact on, on what you're seeing. So it'd be nice to investigate those individual yeah. differences. Yeah, yeah, I think that's a great idea. Um, we, we aren't running anything currently looking at parenting practices or cultural differences, but certainly you're right that, um, well, there are many things about culture pra cultural practices and parenting practices, but the child's relationship to the parent and um, what they think their parent thinks about them, how much they think their parent loves them, um, could impact um, their motivations for feeling accepted, um, or feeling secure with other peers or with a random experimenter in this case. Um, something else that you're picking up on is that there are, dif there are cultural differences and the kinds of qualities that we might value. And so here, these are three and four year olds from Silicon Valley. And so they're like super into showing up and like they're totally willing to demonstrate their competence to a random person. Um, but you can imagine that in other cultures, maybe that just doesn't matter as much. You might care more about um, uh, showing how nice you are or how moral you are or showing off your physical skills or physical abilities. And so I think there's there are many really rich questions that we can ask about cultural differences and parenting practices to get at the individual differences um, in children's motivations here. Thank you. Wow, thanks, great. Three great talks. Um, you could ask why does the study of theory of mind have such staying power. It's really been uh, such a central topic in our field for so long now, lasted longer than object permanence or conservation or any of the other uh, classic tasks. And I think the reason is that everybody understands that uh, if human beings have something like a theory of mind, it changes everything. It really, it changes our whole world. And so it's sort of centrally important to our whole reality. Um, if you think just a minute for why it is that we humans have institutions. I'm thinking of John Searle's kind of arguments, Harari's argument in his popular book, uh, Homo sapiens, uh, or sapiens, excuse me. Um, the institution, John Searle is famous for bringing out his money and saying, this is just a piece of paper, you know, it's only I can buy something with it, that crazy person's gonna give me something because I hand him this piece of paper. Well, okay, why is it money? Because it's somehow an agreement among people. And this kind of agreement requires a kind of a theory of mind, a kind of a recursive um, set that uh, we all believe that we all believe <laughs> that this is worth something and that's what makes it worth something. Or we all believe that somebody is president of the university. I won't say president of the United States because some of us don't believe it, but uh, uh, <clears throat> we all believe uh, that we all believe he's president of the university and that's why he can do some things and not do other things. He has certain deontic powers uh, if he's president of the university and it's because we all believe that we all believe that. It's in our common ground, our cultural common ground. So it's not just that theory of mind, even though you know, we developmental psychologists want to study the roots, it's not just that we are studying this um, uh, ability to mind read one other individual and where something is hidden underneath some cups, but that this is the absolute core of what is going to make us different from other species and to create this other reality, not just a social reality of reading others' minds, but the institutional reality 
uh, which is, uh, I mean, in, in Harari, in his book, just says, you know, what's a more powerful thing in your life, you know, uh, of natural objects or money and Apple and Google and uh, presidents and wars and, you know, these are all socially constructed things that depend on our theories of mind. And that's why uh, I think uh, it has had such staying powers because we realize the wider significance of it for the way that our reality is structured. Um, so Hyo asked me to draw some of the larger implications of uh, this uh, symposium. And as I understood it, her general idea was, let's try to um, extend our notion of theory of mind as we test it in our cute little experiments, our irritating little experiments. Um, and let's try to uh, extend it to how it works in other aspects of children's lives. And I think our three presenters have done a really excellent uh, job at, I mean, it, it extends into our lives in so many ways, but it's three interesting and important ones. Um, the uh, last study with uh, Mika, uh, that last talk, excuse me, with Mika, uh, I think is uh, especially interesting for this idea of um, uh, sort of uh, this larger reality of institutions, because what's different is that in most of our studies of uh, false belief, for example, the content of the belief is about the physical world. And here we have the content of the belief is not about where the cup is or whatever, but the content of the belief is what they think about me. So we're getting a step of recursion into it uh, right from the start. Now, it's not what she believes about my beliefs, it's what she believes about my competence, okay? But here's an interesting, um, um, uh, I can't, I, I can never um, resist uh, talking about comparative facts. Think about what your life is like all day, every day. Think about how much you're doing exactly what those, that child was doing, that you're thinking about how are other people going to uh, view me? Uh, what shirt should I wear if I'm gonna give a talk? Well, how should I appear if I'm gonna give a job interview or whatever? We are constantly monitoring how other people are evaluating us. It's, it's critical to our everyday lives. Great apes don't do this, okay? We have studies showing that uh, well, children care if someone's watching them. That is, they'll be more generous in a sharing task. They'll be more likely to steal or cheat if nobody's watching. From at least five years old, uh, children really are attuned to what other people are see, whether other people are watching and what they're, how they're evaluating. And we have two different studies with chimps, and they don't care. Now, think what a different world it would be if you didn't have to think about that all day, every day. Okay, we'd have a lot. Psychiatrists would be out of a job, mostly, for the most part. Uh, and our lives would probably be happier, but a lot less interesting and a lot less complicated. I think it's interesting in this regard, if I just can give a little side note on this, that I, I just thought this for a while and I never had a chance to say it out loud in a public, so I will. Uh, they, the, the study of, of chimpanzee social cognition started with this idea of Machiavellian intelligence, that they're manipulating others in this competitive way. But Machiavelli, if you go back and read him, Machiavelli is telling the prince how to behave and consolidate his, his power, and at that time it was all his, uh, and to, how to consolidate his power by manipulating other people, and that's where the analogy came from. But, but um, the key to it all says Machiavelli, is don't let them know you're doing it, okay? You manipulate them, but you hide your intentions so they don't know you're manipul You act like you're nice and you're gracious and all that, so they'll think that, but you don't want them to know that you're doing that strategically. So you have to hide your intentions. So the chimps are not Machiavellian. <laughs> they're, they're manipulative, they're clever, they're whatever, but Machiavelli wants this recursive step where we are... Um, worried about what others are thinking of us and we can't let them know we're trying to manipulate them or that would influence what they, how they evaluate us. So anyway, I think this, um, this notion of, this, of, 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 of trying to understand uh, people's beliefs about us and beliefs about other beliefs uh, is critical to uh, so many aspects and ultimately will get you to institutions uh, at some point. I don't have time to elaborate all my thoughts on this, but um, again, the, um, the, the central notion of a lot of people who think about 
the cultural world and the institutional world is that it's built on what is sometimes called cultural common ground that we all believe that we all believe. We all know that others believe that we believe that they believe. I know some people don't like this recursive structure, uh, Dr. Sperber, but uh, many of us uh, th think that underlying there somewhere is this recursive structure of we all know that we all know that we all know, and that's what gives it its objective reality, the, the reality of a university, the reality of money, uh, the reality of presidents as opposed to individuals. So this recursive structure of social inferences. Um, Ildiko's um, uh, uh, really fascinating studies of children making these backward inferences and revision, belief revisions, uh, if I'm trying to draw out the largest implications that I can, I would say it's what we all do all day, every day in our laboratories. Uh, we are all, uh, science is in the basis of, uh, the, the pragmatist Charles Peirce has this famous essay called The Fixation of Beliefs. In, the, in science, we're trying to fixate our beliefs. We're arguing, we're revising, we're giving reasons, we're providing evidence, we're trying to tell the other person why they're wrong, and then hopefully, if we're good scientists, then we want to be receptive when they tell us we're wrong and they show us evidence we're wrong. And so, um, uh, the, the, and, 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 and the belief revision can happen in, in exactly the way her study is talking about, where I can believe something on one base and realize, oh, I didn't know that that was the case. And if I, if I had known that was the case, then I wouldn't have gone down that path, and you know, so you've, you've, um, you've corrected me by showing me some, an assumption that I made previously that led to my belief, uh, and you showed me that there was an error in my assumption, and so I've got to go backwards, undo that assumption, and see uh, what I uh, believe about it. And um, indeed, uh, I was actually asked to uh, participate in a, in a philosophy of science symposium not that long ago, uh, and they were asking me to you know, talk about children's coming into scientific reasoning, and I said, well, I don't study that. There are a lot of people that study scientific reasoning, and they said, oh, make up something, and I said, okay, I'll make up something. Uh, and, and I just came at it from the point of view of, of, of beliefs, that children, first, you have to, before you can understand science, before you can un understand or participate in science, you have to understand the notion of belief, because beliefs are revisionable. All right, if you, if you just saw the world one way and only one way, that's, you can't do science that way. It has to be that we have beliefs and other people have beliefs, and then uh, I have to give you reasons and, and revise and, and all that. And so beliefs and reasons for beliefs, uh, uh, which we've done some studies on children's um, coming, uh, uh, giving reasons for their beliefs in argument in cooperative problem solving, and so beliefs and reasons for beliefs, which often require you to go back when you get a new reason and revise your belief backwardly um, are absolutely critical to the way that we do science as well as the way that children come to learn science. And Hannes has really done us all a, a, a really a great service by pointing out this um, uh, problem with uh, this interaction, this integration between pragmatics and, um, uh, and, and our theory of mind test, reminding us what we all know that many of our tasks are social experiences for the children. Some less so, some more so, but certainly a lot of these interactive tasks where we're asking them where people are gonna look and stuff are social experiences. Um, and they involve these abductive inferences, also in, in, a summer, in a somewhat similar way that if she said this, it, she would only have said this if she believed this. So you, uh, the most likely reason she said this is because that. So um, um, uh, as well, this integration from a more positive perspective is, is what I was taking from the study that um, don't just, let's don't just think of pragmatic problems and how they screw up our studies. Let's think about pragmatics as a positive skill and let's think about how it interacts with uh, uh, our findings. I will, um, I, I will say also that um, uh, one of the things that all of these studies um, uh, bring to my mind is again a, a sort of hobby horse I've had but I haven't talked about in public too much is that I really don't like the term theory of mind very much. I don't use it a lot and, and, and the reason is because um, I don't even think, not only because it suggests the theory theory, that's another issue, but because I don't, I think the analogy is not really that. The analogy in science is we're trying to explain observable things. So we observe various properties of chemicals and then our theory is about the underlying atomic structure and the bonding of molecules and whatever. And it seems to me like that what we have is really a theory of action and, and, and linguistic action as well, communicative action as well, a theory of action 
which is explained by underlying mental concepts. So um, it should be something like, um, uh, um, we should have something like, I, I know it's never gonna take over, the, <laughs> we're still gonna stick with the word theory of mind, but I'm just trying to make the point that uh, it's a, um, a mentalistic theory of action, that's what we're after. Why is he doing what he's doing? Because he thinks this, or because he perceives this, or because he made this inference. So we're explaining the observable action or behavior, and we're using mental concepts to do it. That's what, um, uh, that's what the children are learning how to do, explain actions on the basis of mental concepts. And the reason I bring it up is because much of the way that children are getting to their theory of mind, it seems to me, is by making these abductive inferences from action. She did this, uh, oh, uh, it, it, the best explanation for why she did this is because she believed that, or the best explanation for why she um, uh, said this is because she mistakenly thought that or something. So I think they're, what the children are doing is forming a theory about people's actions, including their linguistic communicative actions, and making abductive inferences for this would all make sense if she believed this, or if she had experienced that, or was paying attention to this and not that. So, um, so with that little hobby horse, uh, I'll, uh, I'll end. Thank you. <laughs>